Welcome everyone, all 55 of us to the virtual launch for Midwinter Constellation. I was sort of thinking earlier today, like, is this the last Zoom reading? Is this, is this the final Zoom reading? But I'm pretty sure <laughs> what she'll thinking. Anyway, um, the nice thing about this book is that whatever launch reading there was ever going to be for it was always kind of meant to be in this format. Um, although when we wrote this book on December 22nd, 2018, we didn't know that we would be living our lives um, on Zoom, et cetera. So it's this funny thing of um, the space this book created being um, lining up with the pandemic, but it all happened pre-pandemic. Um, so um, we're going to read to you from the book. A lot of people are here live. A couple people have sent videos. Um, we're going to go in order. Dan has shown the beautiful book that Shanna designed um, and Blackthorns Press published. If you have just arrived and you didn't yet see um, the promo code, you can use Midwinter30 to get 30% off of the book. Um, and any other Black Lawrence Press title. So pick something out, treat yourself to the end of February. Um, and um, I think I saw Phil out there. Um, so hello, Phil and possibly Bernadette if you're out there. Um, and we wanted you all to know that you can still donate to the um, Friends of Bernadette Mayor Fund. Um, through check or easily through PayPal on that link there. Um, so who in the group has a Black Lawrence title? How about sharing some moves? What a great idea, Robin, thank you. So feel free, anyone here, um, whether you are a co-author of Midwinter Constellation or not, if you have a Black Lawrence Press title, maybe pop the direct link to your book page in the chat and uh, people can check it out. Um, all right, so yeah, this book was made in a shared virtual space. We wrote it in Google Docs, um, that separate Google Docs that were labeled um, dreams, morning, noontime, afternoon, evening, and night um, after the six part structure of Bernadette Mayer's Midwinter Day. And um, as the day went on on December 22nd, um, which was I think the day after the solstice, but also a full moon um, and December 22nd, 1978 um, was the day Bernadette wrote Midwinter Day. So exactly 40 years after um, she wrote her book, we were writing in these Google Docs all day long. Um, and we didn't really think that we were writing a book necessarily. It was sort of just um, a fun thing we were doing. And then at the end, it became clear that we had written a book. Um, and then I sent it off to Diane at Black Lawrence and she agreed to post it. Thank you. And so now it appears in many of your hands. Um, so um, I was thinking it might be nice. We have a lot of people here and the idea of the constellation to me is like seeing us all as little stars on a map. Um, so I thought it might be nice for people to put in the chat um, attendees readers um, where you are, um, just your current location. So we have a sense of that star map in our minds. Thank you. Um, so I am going to kick us off um, by reading a little bit um, from the afterward to the book. Um, and then I'm going to pass it off to my co-host, Monica McClure. Um, and Elizabeth Workman is going to be jumping in too to help me host tonight as we work our way through the book. So if you have the book in front of you, you can kind of find the pages, follow along. Maybe the readers will announce what pages they're on um, if you'd like to follow along that way. Um, so I'm reading from the back. Um, 
147 from the afterward. I experienced it as a sort of anti-feed. All the intimacy that I go to social media hoping to find only to be turned into a product or otherwise rebuked was there in the shared documents. When 31 other women poets joined me in writing into Google Docs labeled dreams, morning, noontime, afternoon, evening, and night, following the six part structure of Bernadette Mayer's epic of dailiness midwinter day on its 40th anniversary, December 22nd, 2018. I realized that in proposing the collaboration, I'd been responding to a deprivation. Where were the textures of people's real lives in the infinite scroll that endlessly starves us of a desire for belonging, meanwhile mimicking the appearance of connection? We typed or copy pasted alongside each other in the documents a virtual happening. The point was to be there together writing. We didn't realize at the time that we'd end up with a book. I'm gonna skip to the end. Uh, 150. Why did I propose this collaboration? I suppose I wanted to find out all over again whether and how, as Bernadette wrote, the day like the dream has everything in it. I wanted to understand more fully, not by analyzing, but by reenacting the magic of Midwinter Day. I wanted to borrow some of the book's power and reinfuse it into the social life of poetry. I wanted to know how everyone was living. What I didn't expect was that we would create a dreamscape of our intertwined lives. Even though I participated in it, writing in the docks and driving to Milwaukee for the Woodland Pattern reading, the book now reads to me like a dream. It begins with actual dreams, yes, but the scenes of meeting up at marathon readings feel just as otherworldly somehow, as if this is what poets secretly do every night, or at least on the solstice as the sun goes down we go out and find each other. The utopian dream of the internet, now infested with bots and data miners, must have looked something like what we did on December 22nd, 2018. Interconnection as oneness, hive mind as oversoul. I'm writing this in the fall of 2020 and amid pandemic longing for collective material life is undoubtedly exacerbating the farawayness of this feeling. We're now eight months deep, two years deep into a historical moment when many have been forced into virtual life in poetry and elsewhere, if they're privileged enough to be able to avoid the physical world. Here we live on the internet to our horror and relief as we continue to try to invent ways to feed the deprivation. Midwinter Constellation is a record of a collective day in the life and life in a day a shared document of poetic inheritance constellated via screens and social life around a beloved book, a glimpse of how we tend to our kin at home and in poetry, and a reenactment of the feminist feat of doing both at once that was first unlocked by Midwinter Day. It took 32 of us to prove again what Mayer already showed. If you heed one day closely enough, you will transcend the illusion that somehow our individual lives are ours alone. Right. So with that, we're gonna jump into the poetry. Um, so Monica's gonna introduce the Yes, um, I'm introducing the dream section because all poets dream and always remember their dreams. Um, we have a lot of rich material. And our first reader is Katie Jean Schinkel. I'll be posting her bio into the chat so you can see what else she's done. And um, I believe this is also a video recording um, that she submitted. So it's Katie Jean Schinkel reading pages 19 through 21 of the book. All right, I am going to make this video play. If there's anything wonky, please put it in the chat and I'll Ring, ring, and rain. I open my mouth to speak hollow in a Midwestern way. I say to you, for someone who had a gay brother die of AIDS, I'd think you would treat queer people better. I say to you, you know I'm gay, right? 
You say, that's reductive. I'm going to hit you with my fist of fingers turned flowers. I am confusion. What is reducing, divisible? The dream is hazy from here. The morning's reactions are stars. A telephone somewhere, longish cord, the half dove as I wrap around my body full. Merry almost Christmas. In the dark and a phantom limb singing cordoned off wire. If a rib cracks mid run, will anyone in miles see me fall? The big dog is in the poop yard howling for the little dog to come home and the little dog is dead, put to rest the day after the election, a bad omen. Ring, ring. How to face the shortest day with the longest dread. I woke myself dreaming this poem, some lines about a tiny table with a, leap, a heap of words on it and the ache in my jaw I get sometimes when I grind my teeth so hard I cracked one and had to go to Dr. Seath to get a crown. Now I'm finally the queen I meant to be, I joked, but it's 4.34 a.m. and I wonder if you're up to dreaming this poem. I've woken Sean who brings me a glass of water who I want to tell about the earlier dream involving the pink squares I rearranged on the screen. But I reach over for the eucalyptus oil, drop some on my wrist so I can breathe it in while I sleep. Eucalyptus is dusty gray with those little round leaves. All the notifications on my phone are about a partial government shutdown, midnight's glass slipper, and Katie sent an email about some hashtags. Later, I'll give some to the poem if it seems like a good idea. And what's your idea of a good time? Bernadette writes to Bill, with whom I once discussed the spelling of Maybelline as an eyeshadow. She writes about her dentist too, a man who wears a gun. She quit seeing him saying she prefers being quote unquote worked on by a woman. I wake to dreams draining from my brain down the circuit of my spine and into my gut where some kind of acid will turn them into instincts I can't explain. Emotional residue today says I was content or curious in the rooms of my subconscious built for me last night. There's none of that after nightmare panic and none of the desperate longing to return to whatever situation while solving an ache. Time for waking dreams, the ones that have to squirm out from under my superego's ass. In gray light, I return to the house in the dream of Nino Nanette, the cyclist who has lost their peloton, and we have become their surrogate. The French woman down the street is hosting us, but we are very far away from Powderhorn. The table is wide and we have to invent the present because the circumstances keep flickering in the dream, but also necessarily in this twilight recall. recall. As if insistent on staying there, the future will not brighten. Each iteration has its own aura and governance, like Frank Big Bear's portrait of the Patti Smiths we passed on the way to artifacts from the sunken city, each dream here its own cargo, ergo, lost world. Nino is fatless and laconic, a dream rendition of our intimacy, its lack or Chris detour to move past static interpretations. And Nino is no oligarch or pugilist. And Nino is no snowman or debutante in the nationless mourning of the third government shutdown in two years. And Nino is the naked intensity of anarchic refusal next to the page beginning, I am exhausted. I wake up at four something to be at my side of the bed asking to join us. Yes, of course, this is the party. And I don't wake again until gray light. He is saying something I can no longer recall of practical import and me finding myself with my hands on my head as if I am standing in a windstorm and my hat will otherwise blow away. Hey, nonny, nonny, crack your tired cheeks. Belbinus said that book beside me says that mare, when they smell the smoke of a lamp put out, bring forth their birth before it be perfect. Thank you. Great. And the next reader continuing, yeah, we should applaud. <laughs> uh, continuing with the dream section, we'll hear Jenny Gropp 
reading from pages 28 to 30, and I'll post her bio in the chat. I look for something to hold and remember first only my sister eating chipotle peppers out of the can at our dinner table in Houston and a politician's mouth swallowing the screen through which he speaks. Dreamwork is a synthesis I try to master, if mastery is even what I want. Yes and no. I struggle with something I know, wake up anxiously looking for what fell out. I could drift back into David's breath and keep that part of him in the world I left, look for the other people who might also be there with me. My sister who dreams of me watching her eat the pep peppers at the dining room table, the man whose guilt-ridden face came from a screen, who sees me seeing himself consume that thing he so desired to eat. I remember now, my mother in the dark, talking to me with no face, only her knees showing in the dark, under the down pink blanket in flowers, talking about the plot her brother left behind. That was all a real thing. What isn't a real thing? There it is, coming around again. Somebody somewhere gives me a name I think I know, but something what does not sink. In dreams, my body still wanted water. The new blinds are drawn, I knew. This is the bed I've always wanted, and Laura is still here beside me. My mouth is dry in the bedstand glass of water too warm to drink, warm as in the same temperature as my body. And there weren't many dreams I remember, I think, because the night was full and late with Kurt Vile changing his guitar for a banjo and a new flannel shirt at the same time. He almost never stopped playing, but part of that was the trick of so many lights, like casino bingo in this new ending world of competing attention machines, not the bingo I knew as a child, pressing colorful plastic chips to letters with my own small fingers, and whether winning or losing, afterward balancing the chips on the sheet and carrying them carefully across the classroom to dump them in a bin and then move on to an arithmetic lesson, now so much a part of me, I don't recall exactly what I learned and still do, and this I know is the dream. I don't dream, but I wake at five thinking about work. I wake up when E goes to the bathroom and A says, I don't dream, but mommy wake up. I say, put on the coffee. I grab the clock of the mother's elbow in the dark Georgia square, she asks, is it wet where I come from? Is it ever warm? If I wake up this time, will I make it by that time? Have you seen my bundle? I insist you were supposed to watch it or was I supposed to watch it? Either way, there was some kind of watching. Actually, it's too early for dreams, too dark for watching only with the skin. Thank you, Jenny. And still in dreamland, uh, Stephanie Anderson will read from pages 31 to 33. I say, I'm scared of getting close to people, getting hurt. In the dream, this seems an original thing to say. She says, oh, let me show you. She has trouble lighting the match while she's driving. It breaks partway and frays at the top. The flame brazes, blazes over the broken bit. She says to put it in my mouth and close my mouth, which I do and feel no pain, the lack of oxygen extinguishing it instantly. I see what you mean, I say. Weird how you're supposed to be okay on your own. Matt wakes me up at eight, says he's going surfing. I think it's the work week, but it's Saturday, the first day of our winter break. I don't remember my dreams, just him scared in his sleep and rubbing his chest in the night until his breath went calmer. I wake up in the winter dark in my parents' house. This room was my sister's, not mine. She's a nurse now, working nights, and does her dreaming in the day. Her little dog curled beside me. I read until I hear the children coming, still dark. My husband smooths a hand along my body, but it's a mom body now. Morning is here, daughter's smooth cheek, a bundle of clothes she's brought to change into, left by my lamp as she runs to find grandma. I wake when you wake, you keep waking. I'd been in a karaoke bar where everyone was moaning or 
was that days ago. You wake again, your face cold. I carry you to the white bed. Whimpering, we wake. You are a younger bow bow, head to board, then rotating like an hour hand the wind wants inside. And again, I wake in blue white winter light like stone outside and heavy. This morning, I laid in bed as M slept and tried not to check work email. I found myself reading, or rather, Googling articles about Genesis Breyer P. Orridge. I'm not sure how they came to the front of my mind. I want to train myself to remember dreams by practicing in advance, but I forget. Last night, I remember falling asleep before midnight and then slept through the night, which is unusual lately. I wake up often, afraid I might crush the 10 pound dog, a fear I've had since M mentioned it months ago. I'm no longer alone enough, but often lonely. I think about the project of physically joining two bodies, the pandragine, the becoming plural, my ear aches. Thank you, Stephanie. And um, Stephanie, I have to ask you what time it is in China. <laughs> it's oh, it's tomorrow, a right? reasonable time. Right? Yeah, it's tomorrow. Um, hello from the future. Um, it's almost 10 a.m. So it's, it's quite, quite late in the okay. morning already. You, did, you didn't have to get up at 5 a.m. for us or anything like that. Well, it's amazing that you're here. And thank you for that reading. Um, all right, we are moving on to a couple of readings from the morning section now. Um, so we will have Linda Russo and then Eric Kaufman. Um, so Linda, whenever you're ready. Coming out into morning breath, blown in my direction, David greets and talks about the cats who are so quiet. I know they listen for a change and something comes. There it is. Balky cries at the door and David gets up. I still try to remember what I lost, catch a goose honk and a train in motion, plain sounds I thought as a kid were clouds, were in transit. I read about the shutdown, steel slats, and think about how there is a nation who funds and droves architectures, manifest of fear, and want for a place that makes what? Their own sideways tower of Babel something to be closer to what? How do you strike when the thing becomes lateral? I look at other people's pictures, Daisy sharing a picture within a picture, Iris watching men in tights. I go back to sleep for a minute. It's not what I want. Take me off, take me to what I left. I can't go back. Calluses steal slats. There is a statement I have held like salt so long on my mind. I remember a comic book Bible my mother bought me and pictures of the tower coming down and the story of Samson that does not fit the other. The story of a boy they try to humiliate and the faces of the boys on his side who only see victory and the face of a blonde who shears off behalf, shears on behalf of face I don't yet see. Why don't I get out of bed? I listen as David opens the bathroom door, listen as both cats cry. David locks them both in the office, opens a can, opens the door, and out they rush. I don't go back, don't get up and watch. The clouds try to catch birds in my window, watch and try to catch them and to, and say to, who knows? Tonight will be the longest night of the year. We didn't intend to harness technology, to lie in bed longer noticing the day brightening with this kitten now purring on my chest, but the experiment is forgiving. The skylight is rimmed with crystalline ice and in the cold beyond bare branches of the walnut tree, the one limb limp where it snapped in a summer storm. The tea kettle is empty, the sink is full, there is much I don't remember, but there is much not worth remembering. And there is what I will remember today, remembering as Bernadette remembers. This part is sponsored by kittens. This part is sponsored by government shutdown. 
This part is sponsored by friendship. This part is sponsored by a screw your wall. This part is sponsored by the tree nursery that was last century. We look out and see the solstice fire still smoldering, a trail of smoke rising from the center of the charred log. The magpies and the maples chur and chatter, the grass a pale yellow under morning frost. I think about last night and its lessons, the importance of gathering, not what was said or what one remembers, but the importance of love. We make our coffees, old hands at this, your French press, my drip cone. At 9.48 a.m., welcome the full cold moon. You just need to go into the day believing that, whatever that task, you are there despite how it blurs. I hear you in the kitchen, a quiet cough, another dishes. I cook eggs and toast, egg yolk, yellow, orange juice, and a text from Pamela. Prepare for mud and bring your favorite shears. Three dried apricots, fleshy baby feet. My brother has asked his girlfriend to be engaged to him with my Mima's old ring, but I thought I'd lost the ring in high school. Every week for 16 years, I felt guilty about that at least once. Who will make me a treasure? The ring doesn't fit her ring finger, so she curled it over her pinky knuckle. I'm going for a run. Maybe I'm cursed. Now there's only 20 minutes till my appointment. I'm not going on a run. I'm not eating. I'm not going to make it to my appointment on time. Milwaukee, Abraham asleep in the poet's room on our new home and Laura asleep too. So I am the only one awake. I left the dream imagining a sunbeam, just its light and very clearly without emotion, only wanting to imagine light and hinged to a day as gray as I expected when my eyes and telephone woke, meeting in light some might call false, but in its generation, I feel truths and know moments later from the weather app that outside there's a cold the same temperature as my age, and Abe's gone through the front door, scoots as he says to his grandmother's 101st birthday party. How could you even write 101st and believe age. I can't and am. I don't think I'll make it there. And how delighted I was to learn she still kicks her his ass in cribbage every time. And I asked him if cribbage was her music, as in most people age and forget certain things, decorum or names, the location of objects or their bodies, but typically not music. The songs stay even after the mind has emptied all but the scores coming out of the mouth as notes. And yes, Abe said, cribbage for her was like that. And there's a cake the size of a car trunk waiting with her name on it for the party. And when he left, the door swung back open to let the warmer light from the hall. And Laura said, the cats are going out too. So she rose and closed it and did not come back to bed. No light today, sweet sun divided, sweet sun pulls back nutrients, impatient for spring, such a touch of better mornings await me. How can I even know that there's what's there between thick sludge coffee and two sparkling of windows? How chrysalis is what I crawl back to. Thanks, Linda. So good. <laughs> this, the sponsorship makes me laugh every time. And then I just get like immediately gutted <laughs> right after, which is I think what this book does to you. Um, yeah, the cats, all cats, welcome. All pets, animals, welcome. <laughs> we include everything in this book. Um, <laughs> it's a cat full of cats. All right. Erica is next. Erica Coffin, reading from morning. 10 a.m. already thinking about death. iPhone autocorrects death to Edward. I imagine myself in the future saying, I had a full life with him, and now I don't want to live without him. 
but I imagine myself saying it to my mom. She'll be gone too. Morning, and it's not cold in Portland, not compared to Vermont. A sweatshirt is enough for driving with my mother to walk circles in opposite directions past the manicured lawns of Garthwick, which are flat e enough not to wind her. So we drive there, even though it always feels strange to drive somewhere just to walk there. As we get out of the car, she says, your sister won't walk ahead of me, even though I tell her to go ahead. Rita always says the second child wants to be with. I don't think it's a guilt trip. You're the oldest, so you're independent, she adds. I run a bit and try to call Hannah, but she's packing probably, getting ready for an afternoon flight out of Boston. So I call Bridget and we walk and talk fast about assignments for our spring classes. I tell her how folklore is defined by its transmission, person to person, changing as it goes. She's interested in information literacy and the rant some medievalist wrote on his blog and wants to ask her students to dig around and talk about it. Mom and I walk in opposite directions. So we give little nods or flutters of the fingers as we pass one another and pass again. I've forgotten the book, forgotten morning's form. So I pick one, decide on a time to leave the room with its empty white drawers climb upstairs to see your faces, small, one cackling with glee every time the cat stalks by. Can I eat this cheese while pregnant? One bathroom breakdown later, you are reaching for a gold sphere, and I see all our faces, yours reflected in the photo, mine wide with the depletion of love, where I think I've come up short to find even more rooms. Overslept by two hours, as did M, and it was harder than usual to get up. M said yesterday was the solstice, and I disagreed because today is midwinter, but it's unclear to me if that equals solstice or not. I know there's full moon and meteor shower, but I'm not sure I know what that means either. I don't make coffee, just gather myself and go home to regroup, then go to Albany, but first a bit of guilt for sleeping in. It's warmer outside than expected, and I'm not sure what to wear or how to wear it or whether the weather in Albany will be the same as Red Hook, mid-40s, the kind of warm that says perhaps a chance of snow. I want to try to avoid the internet until at least 2 p.m. Is the process of writing at various times of day and writing in a way that is just writing akin to automatic writing? I know once I type this, I'll want to edit and revise. I want to change details of the day into fiction, rather myth. I will want to shape myself so that I can look in a different way. Thank you, Erica. We're going to move on to the noontime section. Our high noon readers will be um, Kaylin Madden, Leanne Brown, and Mia Yu. And we'll begin with Keelan. Thank you. Um, I make blueberry pancakes for lunch with a shot of seltzer, which is really soda stream, and try to get the kids to leave the house for an art hive and at the nearby museum that is a repurposed schoolhouse complete still with white porcelain water fountains that smell like pencil shavings. So we can make something instead of just consuming. But I'm surrounded by cancers full moon in who find their shell so cozy and Tauruses who don't want to budge. And as much as I too want to be home to bake miso tahini, tahina cookies and look at the reprints of 60s Japanese photographer mag photography magazines, I am Scorpio and must propel constantly forward lest I choke. I am trying on these ampersands I borrowed from Shanna's closet. They look cute on you, XO, S. Noontime gray cat, blue socks, silver laptop, red yogurt, purple coffee mug, bronze bust, green shower mat, white tiles, black locks infiltrated by gray. Why did I think rage could live in my heart next to my love for the children with no cross-contamination? 
what is the incubation period for ancestral rage? Like five years. I wondered at my own patients how it never happened, never came out at them. The historical hairbrush, holler, knife, it happened and it was ecstatic. It felt so good to scare someone so much, transfer my fear into a tiny body. Symptoms appeared today, December 22nd, 2018. Incubation began when my grandfather's death in 1967 or so, whatever tanning of whatever hide, my mom came and rescued her from my screaming, which was ironic, but also how grandparents work. They rescue you from the monsters they made. In the car alone with Jane, I said, that was scary. I'm sorry parents shouldn't scare kids an apologizing parent, but also don't wake the fucking baby, Jane. We listened to Sister Winter. We went to the play. Oh wait, lunch, we forgot to have lunch. We ate caramel corn in the theater and I had a Fezziwig punch, which is champagne and cranberry juice in a plastic cup. I got some for my brother and then told him the stomach flu narrative, how I watched it spread through my friends on the internet until it got to Paul. My brother pointed out that the epilogue of the story is him getting the stomach flu from this Fezziwig punch. I haven't told him Alice and I slept in the bed that his family is supposed to sleep in. Marley descends extravagantly from the ceiling. There is red and green confetti. These are the carols that in 1989 and 1990 and 1991 and 1992 made my Christmas joy. It incubates and erupts at different intensities, some inoculation, some vulnerability. When I see the back stairs in the theater where the racks of costumes hang and the mirror where I stared at my beautiful chapped, red chapped lips and contemplated my mortality. When I see these boomer actors who were Bob Cratchit age when I was little fan age, my dad picking me up from rehearsal and taking me to look at Christmas windows the night Papa died. Jane laughs at Scrooge's delight at his own pants. In the lobby, Jane shakes Scrooge's hand. We'll go out walking at noontime. It's suddenly mild, a day of rain, and the snow melts off a day of rain, and soft things wake in the gutter, pretty New England town, across the pretty New England river. No one mentioned that this landscape has a deadly way its pines pitch into its sea, but instead let's go in search of a great big candy cane, a special one, large and unique at ampersand, and let's go in search of a coffee. Let's go in search of a thing we can't feel most days, because while every day contains everything, it's not particularly easy to pull one thread to the surface without the bramble of others. I'm always pulling the golden thread. When I was young and I lived in New York, I met Marie and I went one night to a De La Soul concert in her company, but we didn't really talk. Pasta News had a baby that night. His wife did. They didn't go on until two, they played until four. Bruno had a panic attack at the library and we haven't been back since. He owes a book. It's overdue and I think there shouldn't be fines for children too big for mothers to keep track of their books. Their books go in their rooms and they don't ask you to read to them. You ask them to read to you. Read to me, I ask Silas, and he reads me Lost and Found. It's a book about a penguin lost at land and the boy who crosses the sea to return him to the South Pole. But no, that's not what the penguin wanted. He wanted only a friend and his friend's stories. Me too, penguin, me too. Let's paddle through the long year. Thank you, Keelan. Uh, next up, we a little bit of a switch. Um, we have Mia Yu. And Mia is coming to us via video, I believe. Yes, so Mia um, and her daughter just made this video for us earlier today in the future in Utrecht, um, where it is too late to be with us here live um so here we go
even time is an hour full of disagreements, like good coffee spilled into the kitchen sink. One, a vexation. What do you do when flesh and blood hair is unreciprocated? We take up the problem and think about how to move the furniture. Everybody wants something. I tell Gio you can't always get what you want, then pull him from the closet shelf. Blackstone Castle Company, the house on the rock, the cave of the mound, noatc.com, dreamy 280 cattle co farm store, grumpy troll brewery, caution, tractor crossing, Miss Mount Horeb Trollway, Mount Horeb FFA Toy Show, Fisher King Winery, Johnson Creek Premium Outlets, Hunting for Land, Frank Lloyd Wright Trail, BoostProfits.net, Kettle Moraine State Forest Southern Unit, Fleet Farm, Farm and Fleet, St. John's Northwestern Military Academy, Hello Ghosts, Ten Chimneys National Historic Monument, Luminary Walk and Live Nativity, Buck Robe Archery, Party with Pig, Pig Roast, Petit National Ice Center, Milwaukee Mile Speedway. At noon time on 22nd December 1978, I was seven years old in Exton, Pennsylvania at the corner of Woodview and Longwood. There was a big tree at the corner and all the neighborhood kids would climb it and have what they called a rumble. It was on this corner the next door neighbor boys beat my brother Jim up one morning waiting for the school bus. Their mother held their book bag so one boy could hold my brother's arms behind his back while the other boy punched him in the face. Russo's for $100 worth of provisions on the way upstate. And our third reader in the noontime section is Leanne Brown. Hi. At the exact full moon in the Albany train station parking lot, Katie bibliomanced sweet, and then a dream that turns to ash for the middle of midwinter day. We get a text from Marie saying, when are you guys getting here? B wants to start. I walk in and meet Vera for the first time, six months old, soft and tiny and strong blue eyes like Alyssa and round, round head. She grabs my finger. Just now on the way to say hello and hug Soph and Zola playing cards in the front of the cafe, I saw a drawing of a bee going up in an atomic bomb on the front of the New York Times magazine. Bernadette's genius of the poem is unfolding how she can be so lyric like a grand eclipse or actual solstice, cosmic skein or stein, forbidden remembering, but she remembers moment to moment, passing alive like rhyming weather and after. To you, I turn to sing on the eve of a festival. We are here together at last in the Hudson Coffee House on Quail Street. Is it wrong to steal rightly, just like memory? There are so many secret rooms and trees of wonder like people of recognition of so many dreams. When I first met Bernadette, Magnetic Fields sings, I met Ferdinand de Saussure on a night like this as I write. I'd encountered the blinding midwinter day on a shelf in the Brown bookstore in C.D. Wright's long poem class, which I did not take but took at least three others with her and resolved to meet its author the next summer gave me the opportunity when I arrived in the dimly lit room at Boulder Varsity Townhouse apartment, I brought my copy with me for her to sign and having barely met, she wrote, I love you and her address in the front. I don't remember what poems I brought for her to read, but I think one was the one where I tried to make a lake happen on paper with the letter O, like Kathleen Frazier, O Lake. But then to my confused horror, Gregory Corso barged in complaining that a kitten had used his manuscript box as a litter box, but the poems were still legible. I am worried since I think I only have 25 minutes with her ever, but then she asks him to read the poems to us, and I see one can do that, and so he does. With commentary and patter between lines, he critiqued Big Vicky's poems by saying, the moon, you gotta earn the moon, and I always think of that when I invoke her. 
If I have adequately honored and asked permission, like whenever I pick an herb or plant, I ask permission of that plant spirit or fairy and give thanks. When I realize there is an illusion of changed infinite time ready, present in the room. We are listening to 69 Love Songs, which was the polyamorous courtship record from my essentially physically monogamous baby daddy husband I am married to now as the core of my tribe, Tony, and now I am listening to it. I realize it's like a Shakespeare sonnet or Bernadette wanting her sonnets to be love poems to everyone, or at least like Marilyn Hacker's love sonnets to a girl love. So her combo of Phil and me plus others past, present, and future loves makes for a wild menu I'm trying to write my version of in real time. We don't know anything about love yet. We know it all. And generative loss. My absorption in your clothes is only sensible. That's a quote. You and I are like two transparent wings elaborating lists of things. I did put the rest of the clothes away, though I did and didn't want to. Reminds me of my idea to hang all of Emrys's baby clothes in the order of wearing on the wall of the parlor, but that would be traumatic because of gender. List all the art and stuff that's on your walls, past, present, future. A partial liftoff art sold for survival, sold, soldered together to make a wild sauce. Bibliomantic lines Katie's finger chose were the ones she forgot to read out loud that afternoon. Predictive, like so much of Bernadette's poem, is like the talk of the atmosphere and having to move to the moon. Be bear aware. If you meet a bear, do not run. Back away slowly while facing the bear. Alert it to your presence by talking or singing. Thank you so much, Leanne. I'm gonna take over for the afternoon section. Um, so it's afternoon now, and we have Shanna Compton reading from pages 90 to 92. Hi, everybody. Sky on the skin of the river, portal, portal, pulsing tender layer of ice forms, informs, dissolves. Silas points to a storm drain. Pennywise lives there, he says. You're right, I say. At the high school, one of the kids say, you look like Shelley Duvall. I do, I say. Glad I still have that terrorized by Kubrick high out of my mind look of youth. Her performance was so underrated, the kid says. Bruno sells us a cookie and the kids recite the names of the trans dead. Adam buys some chaga for his mom and I say, text me baby, but don't kiss Bruno's head as we leave him there. They've raised enough money to buy binders for every kid who needs one. We walk home down the hill where it's just grass and gravel holding the surface world taut, then mud all the way down. They send an email. The sledding hill isn't safe for sledding. We'll know more later. 4.30 p.m. and darkness rising over the tops of pine trees whose green holds steadfast and waiting for winter. Heat of December, small puddles of rain, five rainbows before night falls permanently. If the trees hold our sorrow, can we listen closer? Today, the darkness seems monstrous and vast beyond recognition. A knock on the door, the bass from the car comes from the earth too. Writer, woman, poet, artist, putterer of nonsense, player with letters, a resolute brick in a broken house, a bucket of questions. What if I gave myself the assignment for the afternoon to look at the past and ask of it the truth? A list of everyone who was there and all the things they said and all the things I think they said but didn't. And when did I first begin to lose my ears? It's hard to say because there are so many memories that have no sound at all but mixed right up to the present with so many obnoxious ones throwing tantrums in the library of my history. S coughs. We have talked about going out to the health food store and nursery, or as he says, the plant place. What of that past? What do you make of his opting for those words over the other? The resolute bricks of us weather beaten each by a big boulder called the parent. Did the house really have a stupid chandelier in the formal dining room that no one used except when people came to play Yahtzee? Is that a real game involving dice? Did I dream of the desk next to my bed? 
the papers on it smelling of carbon copies, the tile in the bathroom a dumb pink, and all of the furniture in the living room hopelessly heavy, as if trying to trick us all into taking it seriously. Yes, the house was yellow, and the kitchen was yellow, and the kitchen table was yellow, and I hid under it while he raged at her. And that's enough. The hole in the yard I went to sit in like a bird. I'm going to put this several boxes down and ask you to type above it because I don't like always being at the top. It's too much pressure. I think it's been three or four days since I put on any shoes. I sometimes wear them on Thursday, I told Katie, if I have to go out. But that isn't correct. I wore black flats yesterday for an hour and went to buy mushrooms for the holiday. Going to the store for food is a good excuse. Let's get ready. We can drive along the river and look out, take in, be surrounded by the day, the balance tips. From Brooklyn to a lake, wood fire, stone, burning. Why does it smell so good and make me feel so nostalgic when I'm from the city? Treetops smell like pine, 22 Jump Street. Let the needles fall to the ground, splat. Nah, they don't splat. Though, do they make a sound? Lights all around, they go on, some go off. I don't know, embers. Poets in rows, sitting up, standing down. When I get inside your prose, I never trip. I'm deep inside the stripped rhythmic torch we all call claws or waves. This is the shortest day and longest night separates us until we meet tomorrow. It's been the most wonderful, terrible week because the days shorter seeming longer and the night longer being infinite or slept are all bright sledges of days in which it seems impossible that we only just met one week ago for the first time. Thank you, Shana. Uh, and now we will hear from our hero, Becca Claver, who kept us alive and creatively engaged through several dark winters. <laughs> Several <laughs> winters. It's been a few, right? Wow. Yeah. You'll, have to, you'll have to tell me about that. Um, yeah, I wasn't going to read poems since I read for my foreword, but then I was messaging with Jenny Graff about um, her sections and um, remembering our um, little adventure this fall um, at, in Milwaukee, Fuel Cafe finally closed after decades, um, which I write about in this section. And uh, Jenny and Laura brought me to the alley outside of Fuel where all these like cut up pieces of the cafe um, were sitting. And so I stole this big red, white polka dot piece of fuel um, wall or a booth, like a wooden booth or something. And now I have that in my home. So anyway, this is the sort of RIP to Fuel Cafe slash arriving at the Woodland Pattern Reading. At Fuel, the Buttafuco is not great this time. Or maybe I'm just searching for a feeling. Coffee 93 is the Wi-Fi password and the feeling. The River West hasn't changed in 20 years. I can still get the same sandwich. The same poets still live here, paying not that much more in rent. Do you think it's healthy to question every decision you've ever made since leaving? I think it's wise to allow that the quest for knowledge might one day bring me back home. Gripped by holiday grief, Gripped by holiday grief, you drop me off at the reading and drive back to sleep. And just as I'm about to feel alone, I see Austin on the sidewalk with someone who must be Saida, who'd come to town to meet his family. So then I'm not alone. I'm chattering and hearing about suburban grocery shopping and the oblivious accidental rudeness of fathers. You look like someone who would know where the cheese was. And then I see Chuck and meet Laura and hear about Jenny's tex mix family recipe from Texas via Colorado. It's delicious. But when she returns with mold wine making, she laments that it didn't turn out as well as she'd hoped, which is what her grandmother would have said too. You inherit the recipe and the feeling. We all laugh because we know. When it's my 15 minutes to read, I'm suddenly sweating. Maybe it's bees, breathless prose, or the mold wine, or my sweater dress, or all the words I don't know how to pronounce, ambliopia, 
but it's perfect because my part because my part starts with a paragraph about Diane de Prima and Gertrude Stein and crazy work for crazy times. I was holding my breath, hoping for this. When I sit back down again to listen, Bernadette has a thought for all my troubles. I love to work and pay the hideous price of seeking infinite knowledge, she admits. Why live anywhere, she points out. Oh, I'm the host now. Okay, <laughs> so we are moving on. I live anywhere indeed. Uh, we're moving on to our most popular section, evening. Maybe because here we are in the evening gathering. Um, so we are going to have five readers for evening, uh, starting with Bronwyn T. Thank you. Like Bernadette, I'm trying to read and make soup at the same time with the clamor of the small children. It's a pleasure to chop red onions and green and red peppers the same and in between chopping to read about teaching fiction and think about truth. I like Nancy Powell's right moves, but she says genre fiction is like a brownie mix. I think any genre, including literary fiction, has its formulaic versions, and I want students to read Ursula Le Guin, Octavia Butler, Italo Calvino, Margaret Atwood, and K. Jemison. Sure, and Eloisa James, or Jacqueline Carey, or Dorothy Sayers, and Josephine Tay. I toast cumin seeds and grind them to powder in the surabachi. Owen says the smell is intense. I mix the cumin into sour cream with salt and put it in the fridge for later. Vesper is whiny and Owen keeps hurling his body on the kitchen floor and almost tripping me. Says it's because the floor is slippery. So I offer to read them some stories. First, we read Too Many Mittens, which is a story about how some twins named Ned and Donnie lose one red mitten and then have all the neighbors and delivery people bring them endless other dropped red mittens until they finally hang up all the mittens on a line in their backyard for others to come and claim. Is there a conflict? Not really. Sometimes children don't care if nothing happens in a story. They like the thought of having too many mittens, of everyone thinking every great red mitten they find belongs to you. Then we read another book called Broderick about a mouse who learns to surf. It's an old book, so I think it'll be good, but it's not. The mouse is ambitious and learns to surf using a tongue depressor that he waxes with a bit of candle. He becomes famous, which seems to prove everyone who doubted him wrong, and that's about it. He retires to a handsome cottage and signs autographs. Finally, we read A Friend for Mousekin. Last night, we read Mousekin's Golden House, where a mouse finds a jack-o'-lantern and makes a home for himself in it, a little golden room all full of feathers. And then winter comes and the jack-o'-lantern sags with cold and closes its eyes and mouth, so you can imagine the mouse very cozy. In the friend book, the field mouse is looking for a friend, but he keeps mistaking birds and plants for potential mouse friends and then getting disappointed. Of course, he finds another mouse in the end when they both flee the same weasel and leap into an abandoned nest together. I read between the children. They're always on my body when I'm home. It is evening, how early, it is too early. The sky's so moody today across the border into Pennsylvania, the light coming in, it's incredible angle across the fence separating field from road and field from field, the houses aglow in it. I can't help but think of it every time I cross how I travel unimpeded as though the blood brain barrier membranes permit me to inoculate the day with whatever junk I want. And it isn't a lot, a useless feeling to notice and to not know what to do, but lament and send someone better another dollar. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. So good. All right, next up we have Susan Briante. Susan. I'm reading from page 115. Turn onto the potholes on Mad Anthony, invisible percussion. He's the general who defeated the Miami Shawnee coalition to blanchify the Northwest territory where I and others squat, sometimes to shit and generally in the wake of war, my genome has arrived and I'm 
0.04% Siberian. When humans know we're hybrid plan and beast, We'll change our plans. My calendar gets taller. Coming soon, new project. Send your bios up behind full moon. Hold it like steering wheel, not paying attention to the road. The climate stood on end. Hand pumping a new toddler air mattress. Travel crib broken. Real pump somewhere on the attic floor. Too many mistakes home and back and store and back and home. The afternoon always already dark, even darker now. What is evening? Is this restful? Want to be reading, gut punch realization, the typing of others, marking this day, making a day. Playing queen with her two older cousins. Take him away, please. You will stay in a closet of spiders for five days including venomous spiders. You will stay in a fireplace for 20 days. I'm still holding you very tightly. I will strike a match. I blew it out. You shall eat mercury. It makes you sick. It makes you sleepwalk at night. But what is a plasma TV? You singing. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, then whistling, vibrato, not hitting the high notes, rinsing something in the sink. I go upstairs to wake the cats, you sing, ask if we should decorate the tree. I can't tell what you're singing. You ask how I like that version. I too wonder what is evening. It is part hungering for reading. It is prioritizing hungers and letting go before day's end. Singing again, hungry again, seeking after being loved. I wanna sit with him close. We stop being monsters, fix on the sazi beans, spaghetti squash, cilantro. There is much color to absorb in the world. The human eye sees more shades of green than any other color. Many think this is due to the prevalence of photosynthesis on this planet that we call ours, but that in no way belongs to us. When you search human vision, color, emotion, you get an article about the psychology of branding, fuck us and what we think of our, what we think of our late capitalist minds. The world doesn't belong to us and we don't deserve it. I don't, I try and I don't. I believe we must act on love. The word human has its origin in the Latin for humble. If we want it to say us, if we want it to be an us at all, live among freely breathing. Alone in the darkness, I'm waiting for you to arrive. And when you do, you are holding gifts in your hands like fruit. Each one shiny and bigger than the last. There's a sense of dishonesty here in the darkness. One shadow portions another and another. And I've been waiting for you seemingly all season. Turn on the lamp. Turn on light. Lamp click three times. I can see your face now and I missed it so much. Here, you say and hand me the heaviest package. Tinsel and glimmer. I won't open, I won't open it. My plan is to throw it away as soon as you leave. When will you leave? Unfathomable that you will ever leave now that you are here again. Winter rain, sweet sun gone. Five pine trees down electricity wire. Our lights blink with messages. Will we lose power? What will we do in the silence and dark? At the very least, it is warm. Your hand guiding my hand saying, isn't this what you always wanted? No, yes, I'm unsure. As we pass Desert Park, the sun starts to slip down the back of the mountain. The windmill's still. The song I don't wanna hear says, we ain't never getting older over and over again. How gold the summit. The house on the hill, half constructed, rises into ruin. Smithson. What wakes in the mountains? What is hungry? In the back seat, Gianna and Ariane are bored to the point of sleep at 4,055 feet above the sea. All the singers we love are dead, yet they still sing for us. We wonder if we see ocean, but when we see it, throws no reflection. We decide it is fog. Beyond the golden bottom clouds, the horizon smears into sky as if drawn with pastels. Christmas lights, 
hang from the roofs of mobile homes off the highway near El Cajon? What songs do they sing under their artificial light? The moon rises in cancer. The kids are restless. I give them candy canes. They ask for audiobooks. The sky sees over the used car lot. The moon looks further away, hung between clouds. Now we turn north, something I've tried to avoid for most of my life. Ribbons of headlights and taillights in red and white, a bow of traffic. And couples are fighting in cars all over the country, CD Wright. It's a long road. I write in the dark. We tie ourselves together in care and misunderstanding. The moon keeps pace. I see the night's first star as we pass the exit for Camp Pendleton. So oh, beautiful, thank you. Um, shout out to the 40 something people who are still here listening to us read from this book. Thank you for being here. Um, we have a few more readers in evening and then we'll get to the last section night. Next up, Marissa Crawford. Hi, Marissa. Hi, thank you, Becca. This is so great. Sitting at the bar in Benny's Burritos, the bartender asks to see my sister's ID. I tell him she's 18 and I'm 14. Most of the time I feel like myself, but sometimes I feel like I'm just the goth version of my older sister. She's on the phone with Debbie when I write this. Debbie says, hi. We have a plate of so many chips and three dips, one of the chips set up to barricade the guacamole. She has a margarita and I have a glass of sangria. They're playing the Lauren Hill album like it's your blue Toyota Tercel in 1999. I hit another valley, so you take over. Predictable noodles and sauce and screeching mouth. I peel four clementines and you chew them, splat them over the edge and onto the floor. We decide on early bedtime. I read and rearrange, rearrange and read, prepping and holiday-less, yet in the books, we know what's next, mouse or brush or exercise. And this can be ritual until we fly across the world to see you, our outsized emotions still in motion. I want to see Jenny and Laura's house, even though, or probably because I know what it will do to me. All those built-in cabinets and old wood floors, plus attic cubbies and the back balcony. They do what I'd expected they'd do. At the brewery first, it's me and Laura and Jenny, and then bestie Jenny arrives and we talk about murderous men in restaurant kitchens. And then Austin and Saida meet back up and Jenny and Laura leave. They haven't had a day off since Thanksgiving and wanna sleep forever. And then Bessie, Jenny's husband and his friend arrive. And finally you drive through your grief and step through the door. Thank you, Marissa. All right, next up we have our two lovely co-MCs starting with Elizabeth Workman. Thanks, Becca. Why didn't you tell me, I say, amazed. Some stories you save for Christmas. The last time I had the surgery, I saw Akila to practice for a memorial for Carrie. I remember Akila said my voice changed. I still don't hear it. Wonder if it will change again in January. Who will hear the change this time? Midwinter day is full of stories. Women and dogs notice the dogs. If I continue to fill my house with books, perhaps I'll become healthy again. My dog is Lola. Is this an epic of the daily? Once upon a time, there was a petite schnoodle whose strength far exceeded her 10 pound frame. She could jump high enough to mount even the tallest mattress, her bark epic and echoic, 
Mysterious things happen when she is alone. Perhaps evidence of this, perhaps evidence of mice, she knows she's a princess, only pretends to be afraid. On the way, and by the time I return, C is practically falling asleep into her pizza, and B, in, a, in an elision of time, is full of stories of Anne Boleyn riding headless horses and carrying her own head in her arms. I picture it tucked like a fucked football, only precious. What did Bernadette mean by her lesbian pencil? Or was it a pen? Pen is perm, pen is penis. In what ways is Midwinter Day queer? That its demarcations go past a poetics upholding a thin-lipped heteronormative wifery? Am I talking to me? Who you looking at? Is it Lewis she later elsewhere calls arrogant, a pen, a pain to be with? And or like Lise Haller Bagason's suggestion, mother is another gender. When the pigeonholes appear so undersized and overcrowded. The other night it occurred to me, divorce, stasis and what remains, impermanence, equanimity. When Nada came to visit last summer, she said, your house is like living inside a collage. And for sure, there is disjunction and hapless affection for horror vacui against the winter, which is a desert. But is it a fixity too, a pen, a sty? What gets walled out? Now I feel an urgency to keep moving things around. I want to tell you more, but it's time to read to B about basilisks. All right, and for our last reader in the evening section, Monica McClure. We are going to meet Matt and Natalie for a drink. I don't want alcohol. I want a liter of water and to stay quiet as long as possible. But when in Rome, driving through Sugar House, E remarks on how much has changed since he and his friends lived there. The bar is called The Ruin, and beside us, and besides a couple older men on bar stools, we are the only patrons. We sit in leather armchairs and drink a big brother bourbon, bourbon, cognac, dry curacao, cold brew, coffee, bitters, maple, and a burnt orange peel. The cognac gave me pause, but it is admittedly delicious. E orders a zombie because it comes in a tiki mug, which is often his MO in cocktail bars. We follow M and N to Mill Creek to walk through the bare bones of their newly framed house. A machine is piping insulation through giant tubes, spilling the clear plastic wall covers from floor to ceiling, as though the house is made of piles of cotton candy or pink feathers. The upstairs room has an oversized picture window where we watch the sunset over the valley. Walking to the car, the temperature has dropped alarmingly. Up on the mountain, we watch a dozen caribou run. It's getting dark and I miss my daughter. Time to head back up the canyon. In the stereocilia poem, I keep writing about the other parts in Patrick's ear poem and the metaphors he attached to other parts, the grief wings of the octaconia, the floating hours of the semicircular canals. I keep writing about the parts in Frankenstein. I keep writing about the logic and grammar. Walking home from the reading, I see they're tearing up the sidewalk again. What work does a catalog do? One thing is ground you during times of shock or trauma. Name five things in this room. Move your eye from thing to thing to thing. It's been night all day, but now I'm sitting at a table with 12 people. So one of them must be hell bent on betraying me. Just kidding. No one can hear me at a table this big. I love when opulence makes me quiet to the point of stone servility like this bust, an imitation of Achilles. I rarely ever think of food as more than a task or an event or a country because I'm a binary, queen and pea. Thank you, Monica. We are gonna move on to the last section, night, and we have two readers. Uh, we'll begin with Danielle Pafunda and then go on to Miriam Yvette, Paris Carr.
The best way to understand a place is to build something there that doesn't completely destroy it for others. I'm in the shower rinsing smoke from my hair rising from ashes to think of this and these words rhythms. You are tucked into the newly cleaned palette of mismatched sheets. Elsie bites my fingers, still kittenish. The continued demon demonstering of winter break. If I could write a poem all day, every day, could I? Migrants around the world remain nameless in transit, jailed, raped, and sold. These are news thoughts, not night thoughts. Ishii, in her quiet way, climbs the stairs in our usual night where you are long asleep. They begin chasing where the imagination in this world, imagination, force, and power, the shapes we allow ourselves to make and what we need from them, five minutes till midnight in Pacific Standard Time. I drive in the rain to the reading, knit straight through it like I used to when I lived in Brooklyn, knitting smooth hills now in different colors to use up the scraps. Words flow and it grows, dark blues and jade and black and bright chartreuse, which I used to think was pink, not green. Now pink is here too. Lines I remember writing about alongside lines that sound new, she did it anyway, tired and doubting, broke and uncertain. I think I need more time to write in an aimless way, or when that's three floors below the light, write the children singing to the bare moon. The dreams are just airport dreams, wrong or poorly packed, lost luggage, where's the baby? I've got a decadent cake I'm not allowed to eat, even in dreams. Sarah shows up, Sarah from my whole life, and she reminds us that the chocolate's no good. The DJ who used to run the top 40 countdown now runs a vigilante squad. They've attached the villain's face and torso to the back of the van and outfitted him a golden black Voltron. They're having a philosophical argument. They're hosting a cooking show. Everyone takes turns frying a button up sock. They add a fish eye to the sock's buttonhole and ask each other, have you ever fried a fish eye before? I can tell I'm not okay. A day can contain everything, sure, but our days can't currently be predicated on routine. We need something exceptional to happen every day until we find ourselves enough repaired. We require, and so I try to engender, something exceptional. I couldn't really sit still when the children were little, and now I can't sit still because we don't have much time. Night comes in and it's not the comfort it once was to know everyone drops off to sleep while I work. I interject that it was a comfort because other mothers were awake all night too. But work isn't working. Work strings one month to the next in haphazard attachment. If the nighttime is the right time for work and love, I've neither most nights. Tonight, I try to nestle a little of both. I read Bear about a historian who's given an on-site assignment on a private island far north in Ontario in a historic house, octagonally shaped, described so that I can picture, indeed, each of the octagon's planes. A bear lives out back in an old log cabin. She must feed him dog food. His fur is matted and she thinks it wrong. Chained like a pet, she unchains him. The novel produces a great interiority of character and yet so little record of the historian's reasoning about the bear. When she leaves him off the chain, she hardly seems to remember she's left him off the chain. I would never forget something like this. In the winter, I like to read about winter places. And in the summer, I suppose I mostly like to read about winter places. Like the historian, I hate the feeling of cold on my skin, but I love the winter and sniff its air with my also animal nose. She hasn't lived her life, she thinks. And I think, well, I certainly lived a lot of my life. She's falling in love with the bear, but she doesn't say it. I read in bed for an hour of suspended calm and then everyone must be commanded to sleep. And as I do every night, I try not to let the children see how distressed I am. This day isn't it either. This day was not the one that would yield. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. <laughs> Danielle, you might wanna check out the chat. You inspired a, a whole new path. <laughs> so anyway. And our last reader, yes, is Miriam Yvette Paris Carr. 
crammed into the pizzeria with a hundred other families, everyone's puffy nylon coats on the back of chairs so that there is no space for anyone to walk through the aisles. The windows are fogged with heat from the pizza ovens. It's too loud for good conversation. I'd like to know what kind of person I must be to be a poet. I think one with others. We pay the check and sprint in freezing cold against the blackest sky across the parking lot. On the way home, A points out the window. Oh, it's the ice moon, she says. I know that one. Brenda says, it's okay to overcrowd bacteria with good bacteria. We discuss the gut biome. Notice she doesn't say bad bacteria. She does say, sit with a food, consider it a medicine. Jean-Jacques tells us after midwinter day, we gain two minutes of light a day. It's a nice thing to say in yoga, but I think I want it to stay darker these nights and early mornings. I love the quality of air and the way food and coffee taste in the dark quiet. I can really hear it. It's been night for two days. Am I to hope for absolution this year? Or am I to stay in limbo here in this prosperity I can't stand? I take a picture of Sarah and Sam in front of the phone booth. I can't help it that old whimsy is replaced by new, a feeling that a dead businessman will pick up. Marty hands me a glass of bourbon intended for Sarah, his daughter, and I misunderstand. We toast to my new job anyway. Pamontes, I reply to Ben's text, and tomorrow I'll put the Betsy Johnson dress Vanessa gave me in the Tiffany blue room. It was the one she wore to Sarah's bat mitzvah. We talk of her mother's upcoming surgery. She says, her muchacha takes her outside to smoke, but I won't. One, metal, one middle class Venezuelan to one sharecropper Chicana, but I get it all, I get it all now. A feminism this evening. Impossible to me, love anyhow, and I was okay all day today, or at least trying, but the bully. I'm not sure of surprises if anything does yet a mirror. A queer awakening of never being good enough for. Five tin cans to my windows, which one is attached to you? Men. Men are no longer. I'm taking off the phone bill. There, it's singularly yours. Enjoy. How is your mother, by the way? All of our mothers will be dead, or as are dead or might as well be dead. Here is one fruit for your sorrow, one fruit for your catastrophe, one fruit for the cigarette lines on the mouth of your travesty. Men are not my audience. Jesus is born this day in Bethlehem, or in a few days. Who invited him anyway? In a manger, another manger, who needs it? It's night in the book, but late afternoon in the day, and the man puts the book in my head and his mouth, and I need that breathing trick to keep my blood from curdling, but still, again, his appreciation of his own sound each time keeps him from hearing the next one in time to save us from his better listening to himself. I'm past the childbearing age, he says. I'm not, not yet. When S reads, it is just right, her voice settling in to the sweep of pages, just right, the certain sweep of pages for her. I think, what if we are all the hijackers of each other from moment to moment, women needing less to be women than to be loved by the cage thing with the steering wheel behind our lives. But I've always had a strange way of dislocating the love and living. At night, the speaker thinks of gender as she prepares the dream, priming the problem for sleep work. A litany of involvement and discovery claiming, again, everything for the poet. I go to my affair with Thoreau last May, but sticking on his claim that in owning nothing, the poet claims everything. So much time has passed, Bernadette says before she begins to read. So much to add. Her cane is hung on the podium made of stacked plastic milk crates labeled Battenkill Valley Creamery, Salem, New York, which are filled with books. She reads the list she wrote, looks up and says, so many dead people. I had many things to say in a notebook that disappeared. It was the upper register of the double bass under the clarinet tone in an apartment overlooking all the bridges I still can't name. Sometimes when I tell other people from my city where in our city I am from, they look at me with some indecision as though to say, how did you get so far from there? I remember a friend telling me about where she lives now, near train tracks en route to the city, how she would come to see me the next weekend if she could only pass her driver's test. And another friend who we took home saying how hard it is just to get out of the house in these times. I want to remember the bigness of the moon. If it was the right time of year for that round, almost fullness, or if that too was a fiction, 
like the menorah overseeing traffic as we drove over the highway and into the tunnel 13 days overdue, which is all to say, listen to how careless I am with my stars. That's it. And that's the end of the book. And that's really how that was the last entry in the Google Doc for night. And it was just perfect. Listen to how careless I am with my stars. Thank you, Miriam. So perfect and beautiful. Um, I want to thank all of my collaborators for agreeing to this project that just turned into many things. And um, I'm really excited to be with you all in person again one day soon. But um, the fact that we have been gathering virtually like this since 2018 <laughs> also um, has given me a lot of life um, and a lot of beauty um, in your language. So thank you all so much. Um, any questions? <laughs> Comments? <laughs> this is the best Zoom. Good comment. Thank you so much for organizing this, Becca. Thank you. It was beautiful. All right, well, I'll hang out a little bit if anyone wants to hang out, but um, otherwise, thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful evening and I hope to see you soon. That was really great. Great job, everybody. Thank you for making this happen, Becca. You make so many things happen. And they're all amazing. This was especially amazing. This was, this is like my dream reading. So thanks <laughs> for being my dream reader. Linda says, maybe continue to emerge with new knowledge and knowing. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Leanne, for sending news of this reading out <laughs> for thousand people today, making sure the mass is new. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> and thank you for getting the blurbs. And thank you for so much else. Yeah, I even have St. John student here. And my sister. Hi, Beth. Oh, nice. <laughs> That was amazing. It's amazing to hear it all. It's not <laughs> yeah, it was so cool hearing those different voices and like reading each other's parts. Yeah, and it was like people were reading their own parts too, but you didn't know where theirs ended and other people just began. So it was like, it was the book again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just had a this moment of like, I have a Mima too. Oh, hang on, you were just reading me, right? It's like, oh, I relate to this. Hang on, that's my words. It's <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah, I had a student email me just now. Like, I told my students I could could come to this, and she was like, "Your poem was so good," and I was like, "It's not. It wasn't all my poem, you know." So she. <laughs> That's I think sweet. it's good that I cushioned my no, mine had the real my passage was just me yelling at my child. So <laughs> you better know what was really you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm definitely one of those crazy people who believes that we're all writing one big poem. So I guess that's that's what happened. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And people, yeah, like people can't even remember which words were theirs. It's like only when someone else is, someone else reads it, it's like, oh yeah, I was there. That was me. But now, yeah, in pandemic time too, it like all seems so far away that it's like, I guess that was my life or our life. I don't know. So glad Mary's Claver and Farrell are here. Yeah, shout um, out to our moms who are maybe still actually here, or maybe just left to zoom on and i doing Tai Chi in the next room. It's hard to know. <laughs> all right. Should we call it? <laughs> okay. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>
Bye. Thank Happy you all. Dreams. Sweet Bye. midwinter daydream. Bye.